Yeah, this is my second time teaching this uh, introduction to data science. I have uh, mostly undergraduate students in my class this semester. Through the past few weeks, we learned uh, more about the two uh, data sets from New York Open Data. One is the New York NYC motor vehicle collision data set, and the other is the Department of Buildings job applications data set. We have two groups working on each data set. Uh, so total, we have four presentations. The first presentation will be the visualization group on the NYC motor vehicle crashes data. Presenter is led by Taylor McClure. So my name is Taylor McClure. I will be presenting on this presentation. It was made by me, by Shintan Sharma and Sakina Imandi, visualizing the NYC crash data. So the NYC crash data set is an open data set that is published by NYC Open Data. It contains information on motor vehicle crashes in New York City. Uh, you can get it at the following link. It's freely available to anyone who wants to look through this presentation. We're going to be looking at crashes that occurred in the calendar year of 2021. And the first thing we thought is, so how many, is how many people, how many often do crashes in the data sets involve fatalities? And if so, we started by creating a simple bar chart to get an idea. You can see overwhelmingly crashes in the data set had no fatalities. Overwhelmingly. So only a very small number had even one and Almost none had two or three. I think there were like two actual in the data set that had three fatalities. So the vast majority didn't have any fatalities. That's good. Automotive safety has come a long way. So we're happy to hear that. So the next, we, so the next, next thing we did is what about injuries? So, let's, so we made a plot showing the distribution of injuries. And as you can see, again, most crashes had no injuries. Then uh, a small num a smaller number had one, and then it, it drops off very quickly after that. So uh, I guess there was one that even had 18. So that was a, a huge number, but yeah. So we observe a pretty, the majority of crashes have no, there's a typo in there that I just noticed. Sorry, injuries, and the number of injuries drops off pretty steeply. So another plausible question. So in, in the data set, we get information on what borough the crash occurred in. So do we see, do some boroughs have more crashes than others? And the answer is that, yeah, Brooklyn has the most, and then Queens, and then uh, Bronx, Manhattan, and Staten Island in, in that order. And we, Staten Island has the least. Um, I believe that's the smallest borough, so that makes sense. So next, in the data, we ha actually had GIS information. We had lo latitude and longitudes of where the crash occurred, the actual coordinate. So let's make a map. So we made a map. Each dot in this data set is one crash. You can see there were, over the course of a year, here's where all the crashes were. And you, you can actually see that Staten Island has lower density of crashes. So that's a cool. The other boroughs, you can see they have... They're pretty dense. You can see, I believe that Central Park right there. So it's cool when you can see things in the data. So the next question, so when it comes to motor vehicle crashes in New York, another question is how many crashes in the data that take place during different times of year? What about the season? We also have the date and time of when these crashes occurred. So we looked at, we broke, we thought, let's try breaking it up by season. So we see winter, spring, summer, fall. So you can see winter, it has the, the least amount of crashes, and then it ramps up until summer, and then it slows down, and it goes down a little bit for spring, for fall, but we see the big drop is between fall and winter. So that, uh, presumably that's because less people are out on the roads, so there's less crashes because it's, weather isn't as nice. So next we have, so now let's create a similar plot, but we put it up by the number of crashes in each season by the borough. So we, here's another plot that we made. We see, again, we see that same pattern of Brooklyn, Queens, Bronx, Manhattan, Staten Island. And that pattern holds through all seasons. We can see regardless of season, Brooklyn has the most crashes and Staten Island has the least. We can also see that the number of crashes in general increases from spring to summer and then begins to decrease through transition to the colder fall and winter month. Another question is, so how is how the number of crashes that occur during each hour vary by different boroughs as well as in different seasons? So we additionally, we had, we can create multiple histograms to show the distribution of crashes by hour for the different boroughs and seasons. So we have, here's the, a little visualization we made. It's broken up. We have into fall, spring, summer, winter. And then we have the different, we have 
the time of day. So at which, what time do we, what time do the crashes occur? That was it. Also information we had in the data was the, the time of day. So we have, we have it in, in 24 hour time. So we see that the most occurs around, the peak occurs around, around 1500, which that is, I believe around, I believe that's 2 PM, I think, or wait, that's 3 PM. Uh, yeah, I believe that is 3 PM. And then we see it go down and there's actually a spike right around midnight. So that's actually really interesting. It's not really clear why that is, but I guess that when we were talking, we, one, one suggestion was that's when like people are getting out of bars or something. So then so from our histogram above, we can see the overall distribution of crashes by hour. It's pretty much the same for the different seasons of the year. It seems the fewest crashes occur in the hours during the middle of the night and early morning. On the other hand, most crashes take place between the middle of the afternoon until the early evening. We look at crashes by hour for each borough. There doesn't seem to be any noticeable difference in the number of crashes for any specific borough across different seasons. So there appears to be many crashes in which the borough where it takes place is unknown. So there were that was one thing. A lot of the the data in the data set didn't have the borough was not listed. So we didn't we couldn't really look at that by borough. So we had to take them out of the data when we were making that plot here. So here just, we can see, we made a, a plot of the, another location map. This time we broke it up by the time of day. So we can see, we can actually see the, it seemed the you noticeably they seem less dense from around 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. which we no, saw in the other graph was the, around the lowest. And then it, it was, you can actually, you actually see it. It does appear to be slightly more dense in the, the noon to the 6 p.m. range. So you can see a little more J. Now, next, we made a simple plot showing the distribution of the number of vehicles involved in each crash. We'll need to make sure that we deal with any missing data accordingly, as each crash should involve at least one vehicle, given what the data is supposed to represent. So we had to, so the way it actually, in the data, the way it was coded is it had the the way we figured it out it didn't say the number of, of vehicles it had information on vehicle one and then information on vehicle two and up to five potential vehicles and some of them it just had no information on that so we took that to mean that if there was no information on the fifth vehicle but there were on, on, on the first four we took that to mean that there were four vehicles involved so that was how we um, that was how we figured how we got that from the data and the most common were, were, were two vehicles there also one was the next most common and then three, four, five were dropping off. So that's how many uh, vehicles were involved in each crash. So looking at our plot, the vast majority of vehicles involved exactly two vehicles, over 70,000 instances. This could mean that many of these crashes were direct collisions of one vehicle with another. You can also see that a lot of the remaining crashes were single vehicle crashes, where vehicles may have crashed into stationary objects, just telephone poles, street lamps, roadblocks, etc. There are a few crashes involving three vehicles and even fewer involving four or more. And that, that is our, that's our presentation. That's what we got. Our next uh, presenter, oh, Anthony, this is a group presentation. They will present some analytics done on this data set. So hi everyone. My team's presenting on crash analytics, but my team's obviously me, Anthony Zemokakis. Benjamin Campman and Ryan Schoenfeld. So first, I'll we'll talk about the data set. We already covered this in the last presentation. The data set we're using is the motor vehicles, motor vehicle collision crash table uh, from open data. So it uh, contains crash event information for all police reported motor vehicle collisions in NYC. So we filtered the data to just like the last group to the year of 2021, which allows us to get a, a good number of crash reports, but also not too large that our um, data takes forever to parse through. A couple, there were a total of 110,000 just about crashes in uh, 2020. And a couple of useful columns that we used in this data set are crash date, crash time, borough. I feel like those are pretty self-explanatory. And then the, the contributing vehicle factor is essentially what the police wrote down for like the factor that caused the collision for each vehicle. So there's five vehicle factors for each up to five vehicles, and they could be alcohol involvement, drive distraction, or just unspecified. Okay. So the first question that we want to answer is what are the most common crash times in each borough? So I want to touch on the last presentation, but it seems that most crashes happen around four to 6 PM, which makes sense because rush hour and the least amount of crashes happen around 3 AM. So 
This is just a uh, simple plot to show the hourly crash count by each borough. So we can see Brooklyn has the most number of crashes. Staten Island is obviously the lowest. They all have a pretty similar shape where there's a good rise in the middle of the day near rush hour. It dips and then pretty much after 12 o'clock into one o'clock, plummet into the lowest amount of crashes per hour. Next question we want to answer is what's the percentage of death in each borough? So I don't actually put this into a percentage, but the numbers are very low in the, in this data set for 2021. So you can see that the Bronx only has 19 crashes that involve death. The zero one is just a binary. So there could be more deaths in each crash, but only 19 accidents actually caused um, a death in the Bronx. So you can see the, the numbers are really low in comparison to the, um, total number of crashes for each uh, borough. Another question we want to answer, what is the percentage of injury in each borough? So I'm going to hand this over to Ben. He's going to talk about um, what he did for this project. Hello, Obam. Um, so we created a heat map based on our information to show the percentages of crashes that resulted in, in injury. You see the code that's written at the top here. And then as you move down to our graph, you can see that almost all of them are around the 70%, 69, 68, 67% inches. So there's not much of a big difference there, but in our next one, we ran a chi-squared regression on these injuries to see if we could find statistically significant data supporting that a crash in one borough is more likely to result in injury than a crash in a different borough. So what we did was we found out that in a crash, there's about a 31.6% chance that in each crash, there's an injury. <clears throat> From here, we went and we found out what percentage of crashes occurred in each of the different boroughs and then found out an expected number of injuries for each of those boroughs based on the percentage of injuries by each crash and the total number of crashes in that borough. From that, we created the chi-squared regression, which showed that our p-value, which is far below our level of significance of 0 0.05, showing that there would appear to be a correlation between the crash in which the borough occurs and whether or not there's a person injured in the graph. Okay, I'm moving on. The next question we want to answer is just the, uh, the number of vehicles per crash by borough. So also sort of touched on this last presentation, but this is just a, a little cross table to show the, the percentages that the number of vehicles shows up in each borough. And the most significant thing I think to point out here is that it has a rather large number of two and ones of vehicle crashes, as opposed to their three, four five crash, uh, vehicle, but other than that. They're all pretty similar and they're not much different, which I suppose makes, makes relative sense. <clears throat> so thanks for the next part. We're going to try and learn. No, I'll be closer to the Yeah. You can, you can touch start. The next part, we're going to be trying to predict if someone was injured or not. So like we talked about before, it'd be a zero if no one was injured and then a one if there was an injury. And to be, to do this, we're going to forest model. So the first step here is cleaning the data and like any data, there's, it's a little messy and there's things we have to fix in order to be able to accurately run a model on it. So here we're fixing the data into a specific format that you can run and use math with. And then the variables that we're going to be using to try and predict if someone is injured is the number of vehicles, the time frame, which is if it's like early in day, midday, late day, the borough that it's in and the reason for the crash. So then here <laughs> below, we can see that since it's math. They can't just take like a string that says like here, it says unsafe lane changing. There's no mathematical way to just know what that means. So you have to create a variable that says one, if the reason it's unsafe lane changing or zero, if not. So here you can see all the reasons for the crash are added. So for example, like here, like this crash happened because of unsafe speed or the crash that a one that's common because traffic control was disregarded. And then there's all the other variables that we talked about, like the borough and time frame. And then the next step is actually creating a model. And like we said before, we're going to be using a random forest model to make the predictions. And then this is very simple way of putting it and definitely not mathematically sound, but random forest model works by making many decision trees and taking the best aspects of them and then use that to try and make the best possible prediction. So here, first we split the data into like a train and test data set. So you can't just run this predictive model on all data because then it will know basically the answers to the data and it won't be able to use it. So let's say we wanted to use this prediction in 2022, it wouldn't be as good. So we split the data into a train and a test, and then we can 
once we make our model with the training data, we can run it on the test data to make sure that it would actually be useful in the future and there'd be a point in the model. So in here we see the accuracy and then the accuracy is a little over 69%, which means that in 69% of the data, we were able to accurately predict if someone was injured or not. So here we would see that like 13,553, we predicted that no one was injured, no one was actually injured. And then here we'd see in 1,715, we predicted one and then there was actually an injury. And then here's a graph to show like the feature importances. So with our model, using all these variables that we talked about before, it assigns a weight to each one to show how important it is. So here we see that the most important factor is the number of vehicles. So when you're trying to predict if someone's injured, not number of vehicles, more vehicles, it makes sense because more vehicles, more likely that someone got injured. And then the second one that was the most important was failure to yield right away. So that was surprising to me. That one would be the most, the second most important variable in all the variables that we use, but definitely could have use to anyone trying to stop people from being injured in car crashes. Okay. So what I did on this project was very similar to Ryan's. It's another classification problem about predicting whether or not there was an injury in a crash, but this time I use a support vector. So what a support vector machine does is essentially, if you imagine a bunch of um, points on a graph, uh, it'll attempt to essentially draw a line, which is called a hyperplane between the points to basically classify them into, for my example that I'm like, explaining into two groups. So for this one, same as Ryan, we split it up into tests and training data. This is so that we can train the model on part of the data and then make sure that it's slightly accurate afterwards on the test data. So essentially I just build a support, support vector machine with the, uh, with a linear kernel, train the data and we'll predict it. So the accuracy is relatively similar to the uh, random forest at 68%, which means we were, we were able to ac accurately predict whether there was an injury or not in the crash about 68% of the time. I was also, I also ran this for deaths, but unfortunately there's, I guess not unfortunately, but there isn't enough data on deaths in, in the data set for the classification problem to actually predict that someone would die. So running a model like this would predict entirely injuries and it might have a really high accuracy rate, but that's just because there are so few deaths, but in this case, 68% is relatively similar to random forest, pretty decent, but could be better. So yeah, that's all for our presentation. Well, thank you. Thank you. This concludes our analysis of the first data set and from the audience, maybe this is a good time. If you have questions, then we can, uh, take some questions. Here comes a question. Did the team think about how the class is in balance? if there is one, might affect the classification that models. Uh, Anthony, you want to address that? Actually, you mentioned that already, right? Because your death, predicting death is harder than predicting injury because of the imbalance. So, they are. Right, they are. It, basically, death is a rare event. Yeah, we did a little bit. Obviously, we, the first one that I built was the death model. Um, and the accuracy was so high that I thought it was brilliant, but um, when I actually looked at it, it was, it was really poor. So we took that, um, into account, but, um, I'm not sure what else to say there. What was, do you remember the proportion of injury? What's 30, 30%, 30 right? About 30%. Now let's move on to the next data set. Next data set is the NYC Department of Buildings job applications data. And we choose this data because this is the most vi most viewed data set at NYC Open Data website. The first team will be on visualization led by Matthew Chandy. Uh, my name is Matthew Chandy. I'm a freshman here at UConn. I am majoring in statistics. My name is Sam Hughes. I'm a data science and statistics major, and I'm a senior. So my name is Robert Schmierin. I am a senior at UConn and a and I'm a double major in statistics and economics. All right. So the, uh, the visualizations in this presentation are sourced from the NYC open data department of buildings, job application fillings data set, which contains data about renovation job applications submitted through the New York city department of buildings. There are over 2 million entries in the original data set, but we filtered the data entries in January, 2022 for, as you can see here, there's a lot of columns. It says at the top that there's a total of 98 columns. So our goal with this project was 
to find ways to visualize it to make it a little less overwhelming to look at. So what we started with were some plot ideas with Plot9. And Plot9 is simply a Python package that um, is based off of R's ggplot. And we won't spend too much time talking about the Python code, but if you want to see that, it's uh, it can be all found in our uh, GitHub repository. Uh, so the first question that we had was uh, what were what are the uh, most popular months for a job entry date? And a job entry date is just the date where the, the entry is complete and the payment has been made for the job. So to answer this question, we can make a bar graph that counts the amount of job entries in, in a given month. And for fun, we also color coded the data by, as you can see from this graph, it seems that it's relatively even throughout the months, except towards the end, towards October, November, and especially December, there's a higher amount of entries. And um, well, like I just said, December has the most entries. And in, in all likeliness, this is just due to the way that we subsetted the data because we're, we took most of the data from January and February. So therefore, it's more likely that the job entry was in the later months. Another question that we had was if any boroughs typically had taller buildings. And the way that we answered this question was with a histogram. So the following histogram tells us the distribution of the amount of stories a building will have after its renovations. The output is split by borough so we can easily see the differences for the different areas of New York City. So as we can see, at least proportionally, most of the boroughs have a few stories, except for Manhattan, which is uh, visually, you can tell it's a little bit different of a distribution. There's uh, proportionally a higher number of proposed number of stories for Manhattan. So right here, we see a summary statistics, which can be useful that while the graphs are useful to make visualizations, it can be nice to have a summary statistics to make quantitative assessment. And very clearly from the mean of the, uh, by each borough for the height of the buildings, we can see that all the other boroughs are in between two and five. And then for the number of stories, and then Manhattan is at 14.82. So clearly much higher. And, um, like I just mentioned from the graph in summary statistics, we see that many of the New York city buildings outside of Manhattan Main, mostly consists of one to five stories. However, the buildings in Manhattan have a much larger average amount of proposed stories and the distribution of pr proposed stories is very different than the other bird. And our final question for the plot nine graphs is some jobs require a certificate of occupancy. For these jobs, are there any ownership types that have a longer wait between job entry and approval? The next graph shows us the distribution of the number of days between entry and approval for the different types of building ownership. Note that there were, we're only looking at jobs of type A1, which means that the job requires a new certificate of occupancy. And here's our plot. This is a box plot. And as we can see, there's a few minor differences, but overall the waiting time does seem pretty similar. And once again, we also have a summary statistics output where we see that the means are relatively close within 50, which is days of waiting time. So not too much of a crazy difference. And looking at the graph as well as the summary statistics, we can see that the distributions of waiting time seem quite similar. In other words, there does not seem to be any indication that the type of ownership significantly affects on the amount of days between entry and approval. Cool. So that was visualization of the data using the plot nine package. And another package we can use is the Google map plot, a Python package or the GM pool. With that, we can easily visualize any data set that includes data for latitude and longitude. Uh, and luckily the DOB job application data set does include latitudes and longitudes for each application, for each building, for each respective application, meaning we can visualize where most of these applications fall. So here is a basic scatter plot. We can zoom in, it's a little laggy, but yeah, we can see where all of these applications fall. As you can see, there's a high density of applications in Manhattan. Yeah. 
So we can also scale points based on a certain variable or a certain column in our data set. So in the following example, the points are scaled based on the number of proposed stories in each building. Unfortunately, we can't add a legend with GM plot, but we can still compare the relative sizes of each circle. And as you can see, unsurprisingly, there are a lot of tall buildings in Manhattan, but it seems that there are a few taller buildings, higher rises developing in, in Brooklyn and in Queens. Yeah. And the following map uh, shows the location of each building and scales of points based on how long it took for the application to get approved after it was entered. So the original data set that has data on entry date of the application and the approval date of the application. So using some data manipulation and some simple math, uh, we can get a we can create another column, a numeric column called waiting time to use in this map, as you can see. So all of these points are scaled on the waiting time for each application. As you can see, again, there's a high density of points here. And on average, the waiting time seems to be quite high here in Manhattan and in this part of Brooklyn. But there are also a few applications with very high waiting times to see faintly, you can see a very large circle here in the Bronx, then another one here in Staten Island. And yeah. All right. So um, uh, another one of the variables that we wanted to talk about was the estimated initial cost. Obviously, when we were talking about the variables in the data set, we wanted to choose ones that had a high interest level for maybe people that weren't interested in the actual data science aspect or interested in just mo knowing more about the information and could probably find it useful, especially for someone in the New York City area. So for this variable of initial cost, it uh, was talking about the estimated uh, cost of the building when they um, originally were working on it. So this is obviously very important for um, someone that may be looking to do something on the more expensive end or is looking for someone that's looking to cut costs. So being able to visualize that is very important. So this is what we were able to create with the initial costs. As you can see, it's the very common theme is that we have a lot of density in this area. It's the initial costs were very high and there's also just a lot of data in that area. But you can, if you look around with the data set, there's uh, a lot of variability through, but a lot of the initial costs are all over the place because as I mentioned, they are estimates. So they can vary very greatly regardless of where you are in the map. So that was definitely a very cool thing to look at that it doesn't have to be from one specific area to be a higher initial cost than another. Another thing that we wanted to use for visualization was a heat map. Obviously heat maps are very important for looking at data in a different way than just points. Uh, so we use the Longitude and, lat longitude and latitude points that we had from the data set. And we were able to see a better view of the density of all of our points without having any specific variable in mind. So they, they don't vary based on um, uh, other variables and data just besides just the frequency that you've seen them uh, in the specific area. So this is the heat map. Obviously, the, uh, the stronger the color with red, the more um, points that we have in the area. And it follows a similar trend that this Manhattan area is going to have a lot more points. So there's just a lot more people and buildings in the area. So it makes sense to have a lot more applications and a lot more longitude and latitude points in that area. But throughout the map, you can see some of the spots that are a little more red in this area right here. And then obviously the ones that are a little less frequent it just shows a distribution of the different buildings and where it's more likely to have a building application put in place. That's our presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I just want to clarify uh, on the map that it's for development purpose because Google started requiring smart authentication recently. <laughs> our last presentation is some analytics on the Department of Building Job Applications data. Everybody, I was on a team that was looking up more into the uh, the actual analysis of the job application data that we had. Alongside, I had Zen Yu Zhu, as well as Talia Taff. And uh, my name is Peter Buzo. And uh, I'll let you into, I'll have a little insight into the data that we had. So the first thing we had to start off to do was clean some of that data out. And obviously that just starts with a simple read CSV. You can see that there's a lot of columns, 96 columns. Uh, we don't really need to deal with all of that. We're only gonna be interested in a few here. 
So for that reason, we subset the data. And so these are the ones that we took. We also renamed some of the columns to make them make a little bit more sense for us. And we created a column number of days for approval. So that's essentially the amount of days that it takes after some entry is created on the date and then when it is approved. And that's going to be an important, and that's going to be something that's going to really help us predict and also something that we're going to try to predict because that's going to be useful information for anybody that's trying to go through these coding. All right. So since all the covariates are categorical variables, we need to change the format so our model can implement them. And here's just a way that we can categorize the variables. It's pretty simple. And then here's where we create the array for the number of days. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to train a, a random forest regressor. And here's a lot of some sort of messy code, but you can see the output at the bottom. And as you walk through it, you can actually see how everything is followed through. We have, you know, we separate our data into train and test. Uh, the way we do that is through an 80, usually the 80, 20 rule, which is we use 80% of the data that we have at our disposal in order to train our models and 20% uh, to actually validate or score our model to see how well it did. Uh, we set our max depth to four, and then you can see as, I'm sorry if that's a little small for the actual tree, but uh, this just shows how some of these splits went through and how some of these trees were created, created to develop the, the entire forest. Furthermore, as we move through, we can look at the importance of features and we can see that the fire alarm is actually a very important feature for this particular model. And uh, that's what you can see right here. And then we also saw with, with plumbing as well, not nearly as important, but certainly has some more significance to it than a lot of the other variables. So now we can val evaluate the model and see how we did. And this is where we're going to score the model or, or validate it at least. You can see in the output eight that we have right here, we actually have some pretty small differences, but our mean absolute error calculation was rather high at almost right 124. So that kind of led us to believe that there may be some outliers here that are adjusting or at least making our model a little less accurate. And what we do is we can change the ascend and we can look at a different side of this data and a little different side of the actual and predicted. We can actually see that these have very high differences in the actual versus predicted values that our random tree or random forest regressor rather perform. And, and this is just emphasizing that fact, probably some severe outliers that gave us a lot of error. And so now, Here's a look into some other models that we built to analyze the data. This is a simple Poisson distribution, and this is going to predict the, the time acceptance, how that was the, that new data point that, that we implemented that measures the time between entry date and the acceptance date. And that's that acceptance time right there. And this is just, we're trying to have it explained just by one, um, variable, which is city owned. This is just a Boolean variable and it's just whether or not this building is city owned. And in this case, it seems like with that really low P value and that Z value, it's like negative 195. This is probably a pretty good predictor, which makes sense. City owned stuff is going to go probably a little bit faster than other more privately owned buildings. Furthermore, then we tried a few more predictors. So we're still looking at acceptance time and now we added not only city owned, but the borough, building type, job type. And we look down at this and we see that all of these with the exception of job type DM and borough Manhattan still close to being able to be significant, but not quite there. The job type DM is obviously um, pretty atrocious with a Z value that's so tiny, but these all seem to be pretty good ways that we can predict our, our acceptance time. And we can see we do it with job type. And then this can, you, we can accentuate that DM. You can see how that has a very high P value. Definitely not a good predictor. And which was the, what's the base? For job type? Yeah. I'm going to assume it's DM. I couldn't find any well, more. Well, because the, the, when it, what, the way it comes into it, it's pixel one would be the base thing. And then it makes all of the variables are set to one, it'd be different. So that the coefficients on that, since I would imply that 
whichever one the base case is, there's a difference between that. Yeah. But if the base. Oh, right, case, right, right, even right. Even the, the, that would not have its own variable for all of the variables are set. So, yeah, more complications to it. But, and then you can look at burrow, a uh, very similar story. And building type. So this is just separating all the, uh, where we had that one that had a lot of the, had burrow, building type, uh, job type, all those together. This is just a separation to uh, view them as they are individually. And then lastly, just a little like something extra that we decided to throw in was a test for significance with a robust linear model. So the robust linear model was more of a way where we can score against some of those outliers are out there. As you can see, this is just looking at, so that, that acceptance time and number of days are, are the same, um, are actually the same variable. It's just a different naming convention. And then cost estimate and professional certification are just two different uh, variables that we could use to predict on. And then you can see a little interpretation here with those very low P values, high Z values, probably from pretty good predictors for our piece. And that concludes the presentation. Thank you. I guess this concludes all four presentations. I think we have, we have time for questions. Zach, can we ask people just to unmute themselves and ask questions? I think people should be able to, to hear you, but I can certainly put that. And yeah, people can certainly um, ask them. questions if they would like. Then Zach they should be able unmute to unmute themselves. Cool. Okay. So I'll ask a question. This is of when you are comparing both groups compare the data across the boroughs, but the boroughs have different distributions. If we are looking at the crashes, there are definitely different number of cars, different number of people living there. Have you taken the different characteristics of the boroughs into consideration? Did you in some way or one? So, that you predict could be a, a pretty big thing. So like, for example, I mentioned that Staten Island had the lowest number of crashes and it also, it's, I believe it's the small, least populous borough. And we didn't really do a whole look too much in that just because that would require getting the information outside of the data set. Uh, at least my team didn't do any too much with that. We, we mainly just uh, focused on the data that was in that we had right in front of us, but you definitely could and that a very, a very obvious further step would be to go and look at the different characteristics of the boroughs and see if, if they have, if those have predictive value, which I imagine many of them would, but we didn't, we, you'd have to, we'd have to collect data on that. Um, if I may, so this is more from a, the perspective of this, these different projects as a learning experience. So first of all, well done to all of the teams. Thank you guys. Uh, thank you all for the presentations, really interesting stuff from the perspective of kind of learning data science. And, and this is, this question is open to anybody. What are some of the, the, um, if, if somebody could think of one challenge or something really interesting that you found in the process of developing a data science project, what would you say was like an interesting challenge or something that, that you learned that you might not have thought you would? So something that I found interesting was that like the whole process of data cleaning is a lot more like time consuming than you'd expect. I feel like um, a lot of the variables, if you add new variables to your data set that you want to investigate, there's quite a bit of coding that goes into that as far as changing like the type like the, the data type cleaning and all that. So that was something that I found interesting. I thought data cleaning probably wouldn't take all that long, but it turned out to be a lot more time consuming just to prep the data the way you want it. Cool. So I'm, I'm going to reveal myself a bit. I'm actually a professional data scientist. And the fact that you said that uh, corresponds really well with what I, I say to folks. Data cleaning is usually 80 to 90% of the work. If you don't like that, yeah, but it could be fun. It could not be. Thank you. I, I was just going to say another thing that, that, that we learned. So working collaboratively in a group, we all, for, for the, as part of this class, we all, we've been using Git and we, a lot of us, this is either the first time we've used Git or one of the first times that most of us don't have, aren't super experienced and just learning how to get, how to make Git work is actually a, a and how to use it to, to collaborate in groups. That was a, a very useful skill that I'm, that I've taken away from this class and from this product in particular.
Well, I actually didn't teach them how to do that. I just give them an exercise. And that's the first homework assignment to figure out how to use Git. Wow. Well done then. Uh, it's, if you've never used it, it can be a little mystifying. There was a, there's this online exercise. There's a, just choose the first uh, 11, right? First 11 exercise. These are the very basic ones. So with them, they should be, should be equipped to get the homeworks started. Uh, if not, I think we are right on time. I'd like to thank all the attendees for coming to our session. And this session, <clears throat> oh, this is my, like I said, this is my first, the second time teaching this course. And I like to uh, build in some real world data science project into my course. Last semester, my class did a traveler's uh, modeling competition. And this semester we did this uh, open, New York open data event. And turns out students are very excited. They went out of their ways to learn things that I haven't taught them yet. So this is a great experience. I know some of the audience actually are colleagues who might be teaching data science and comments and suggestions are always welcome. And you can find my, the class notes, the, the class note, this is uh, another thing I invented. Hopefully we have the class notes on, on the GitHub repo and all the students are my collaborators. And they push their, well, they do a topic presentation on a topic they choose and then push their things into the repo. And overall, the whole class notes is built on the collective efforts.